Hi everyone. In this video, we'll take an in-depth look into simple linear regression. This is a very important topic and it's fundamental to many different fields, including machine learning, finance, engineering, amongst many others. Before we get started, let's take a look at the packages we'll use. These include NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, sklearn, and scipy. Great, let's get started. The first thing that we have to get a understanding of is linearity, specifically a linear function, which is a function whose graph lies on a straight line and which can be described by giving the slope and y-intercept of that line. We'll code out this linear function here, y, which is the output, and it's equal to 2 multiplied by x, which is a given input, plus 4. What we'll do is we'll create a function, and we'll call it def linear func, and it will take one input, which is x. And what it will return is we'll take 2 multiplied by x, and we just simply add 4 to it. We were able to code out this function, and let's take a look at it visually. Great. And we can see that this function is a straight line like we was described in the definition of a linear function. What we can see is that we increment this by 1 and on the x-axis, and for each increment, the y output will increase by 2. And this is going to be the same increase each time, which would make this a linear function. And we have our definition of slope here, where we have y sub, one, y sub i, which is the first value, of, at, which is a point for y, minus y sub i minus 1, which is the previous value, and we divide it by that x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. And what I'll do here, just to make this more clear, is I have this coded out, and we'll take a look at this in a pandas data frame, where for the y value, we'll use our linear function for the to create the y values from 0 to 20, and we'll also take a look at the slope itself, which will be constant. And here we really have the tabular version of the graph here, where we have x value. For that x value, we'll have 4, because we'll have 2 times 0, which is 0, and then we add the intercept, which is 4. And that if we had a negative value, the difference would be 2. Now, if we increment the x value by 1, we have 2 times 1, and then we add 4, which is the intercept, and we get 6. And the slope is going to be the difference between the y values, 6 minus 4, and we divide that by the difference in the x values, 1 minus 0, and that is going to be 2. And we can see that if we increment by 1, that slope is going to be constant. And that really defines a linear function. What we'll see is that in actuality, we don't have this sort of clean linearity in our data. There's going to be some noise here where the, the difference between the y values may vary a bit. And that just shows that our data doesn't exactly follow linear function, which is what we'll approximate. And we'll see that now. What we'll do is we're going to create an artificial data set. And we're going to have two variables, x, which is, again, the input. And we're going to use a, a real-world example. And this again, this is a real-world, this is a artificial data set. And this doesn't exactly reflect the, the actual cost of mining a Bitcoin. It's probably more expensive, and it probably doesn't even approximate linearity. But we'll just do it. We'll just say it does for the simplicity of this example. Anyway, we will have x, and x is the input, and it's going to be the number of hours it takes to mine one Bitcoin. 
And then we have Y, which is the output value. And that's going to be the cost of mining the Bitcoin. And this just describes the some of the terms that we need to get familiar with. X is going to be the independent or explanatory var variable. So what we'll do is when we start to model this, X is going to be the input for the model. So the number of hours it takes to mine a Bitcoin is our input. The output is going to be the cost of mining the Bitcoin. And that's called the dependent or response variable in our model. And what we want to do is say that we want to try to set up a rig of some sort to mine Bitcoin. Given the number of hours it takes to mine a Bitcoin, we want to forecast the cost of the mining process. And then finally, what we have is at the end is this epsilon term is random noise that can be found in the process. And we'll see that when we graph this out, the, the slope or the difference between the X's and Y's is not going to be completely linear. It will approximately be linear, but it will be a bit more scattered. And that's because in reality, things are more random and messy than a the cleanliness of a linear function. And this is the process itself. So we're interested in the cost of mining a Bitcoin, which we'll eventually model. And this is the process. The number of mining hours is multiplied by the cost, which in this case is going to be $100 per hour. And then there's going to be some random variable here that will increment the cost by X amount of dollars. Let's do that now where we create this function. So I'm going to create another function. I'll just call this def func. And like before, it will just take one parameter X. Then what I'll do is I'm going to model this out. What I want to return is we're going to take that input value X. And again, what this X represents is the number of hours that someone is mining a Bitcoin. We're going to multiply that by 100 here, which is going to be part of the cost. And then we're going to add a random variable epsilon here. And I'm going to add a normal random with a mean or lo location of zero and scale of 40. And just to very simply, just to put this very simply, we'll on average expect this random variable to be zero, but there is some stand, there is a standard deviation or variance to this where it can jump by $40 up on average by a few standard deviations or down by $40. And that's just a very simple approximation of what the variance is just to keep things simple for now. Okay, let's run this. Okay, so I have that run. Next, I am going to create the number of hours are x and i'm going to make it pretty small so i'll do np arrange and this is going to create a value a range of values from one up to but not including 12 and we're going to do this by one so this will will for the hours of mining it will go from one hour up to 11 hours next i am going to call np.random seed and what this does is if anyone following along wants to recreate this you run this within your jupyter notebook cell or in your python script or your google colab cell finally i am going to create the actual cost of mining the bitcoin and that's going to be equal to and we'll call it np array just to make this an array then I'm going to do a bit of list comprehension where I'm going to take our function 
and run that function on each of these x's. So I'll take x, multiply it by, put this in, and this will go for a, and run the function from x is equal to 1 up to x is equal to 11. Okay, let's get a visual of this. And this is, this isn't our linear regression yet. This is still the process of it. And using matplotlib, we'll plot this out. And now we can see our visual of the Bitcoin mining process and what the cost is. And if we're a miner, say that we got this from one of our friends, and this is the cost that they got. For the first hour, it was roughly 100, a little over $100 to mine a Bitcoin. The second hour, it was a little less than 200. The third hour, it was actually 400, so it jumped significantly. The fourth hour was just right under 400 then it keeps incrementally increasing as we increase the number of hours. And we can see that this is similar to a linear function, but we still have these random jumps here where there's still a bit of noise and we're not quite sure that this process is linear and we want to model it. And this is the real big difference between a linear function and linear regression, where a linear regression, you're trying to predict something. But for a linear function, if you know that, then you have the exact answer. And you don't have to predict anything because you have the mathematical function. You just plug it into the function and you get back the exact answer. In our case, we don't have, we won't have the exact answer for each of these. And that's where the prediction comes in. Okay. Let's move on. This is something that we'll circle back to after we've created our model. But a very important part of linear regression is understanding the assumptions of the model. Four assumptions that linear regressions make. The first is the relationship between the dependent and independent variables must be linear. The error, also known as the residuals of the model, must be independent from the dependent variables. So our independent variable, again, is the number of hours that we're going to mine, while the dependent variable is the cost. And the error is the difference between the actual values and the predicted values for the dependent variables. The model errors need to approximate a normal distribution. The variance of the errors need to be homoscedastic, meaning the variance is constant over time. And We'll model all these out to take a look at these. But these are very important to know. And when you start modeling, it is important that you test these assumptions like we will towards the end of this video. Let's actually get into the simple linear regression now that we have a idea of linearity and what a linear function is. A simple linear regression models the relationship between the independent var variable so in our case, hours of mining, and the dependent variable, the cost to mine a Bitcoin. And here is the notation for this. And this Y sub predicted is the estimated cost of mining a Bitcoin. B sub zero is the intercept. Then we add to the intercept B sub one, and this is our coefficient that we're going to multiply x by, and x is going to be the hours spent mining. Finally, there's this error term. And we saw that there was an error term in the artificial data set we created. We also have this error term here where we, don't, we won't be able to exactly replicate the data in our model, so we'll expect some sort of error. Okay, the first, we'll actually code this out two different ways. And the first way is we're just going to use a bit of algebra to get the beta coefficient. And this is the mathematical notation for this. And if you're still new to mathematical notations, it gets easier over time to read this. So what this really says is 
we're going to, in the numerator, take each of the x values and subtract it by the average x value. So we'll take, for example, the cost x is equal to one, or there's one hour of mining. We're going to subtract that by the average time spent mining. We're going to multiply that by the observed cost of mining for that one hour, subtract it by the average hour of mining, and we're going to do this for all the values and sum them all together. And in the, in the denominator here, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take each of the hours subtracted by the average time spent, raise it to the second power, and sum over that as well. And this will give us our beta coefficient, which we'll multiply the x values by. Let's code this out. And for this one, I am going to call it linreg and beta. And it's going to take two inputs. We need the x values or the time spent mining and the y values, which is the observed costs. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the observations of each of the hours that were used to mine and the observed values of the cost to mine those. And we'll just code this out here. And this is just this mathematical notation here. This is the code form of this, where we use some list comprehension, take the each of the x's, subtract it by the average x, multiply that by each of the y's subtracted by the average of the y's, take the sum of that, then divide that by the sum of the squared differences for the hours. Okay, let's run this. And we have our beta. And let we have our beta function. Now let's actually do this. I'm going to store this in a variable called beta. And I'll call this linreg beta which is calling our function and we're going to put in x which is the number of the number of hours spent mining multiply that by the y sample and then I'll return this great we have our beta estimate what we'll do is when we start to model for each of the observed hours each of the x's we will multiply those x's by this beta here so what that will entail is we'll do beta multiplied by one, beta multiplied by two for two hours of mining, so on and so forth. We also need to solve for the intercept. And what the intercept here is, here is for this linear function, it was easy to see it's four. That's right at the beginning of the slope here for this line. And we need to also find that for our linear regression, and it will roughly be somewhere here. Let's do that. And what we'll do is I'll call this def lin reg intercept. It will also take the x's and y's And we also actually need to put in the beta as well. And what I'll do is we need to get y, x, and we're going to just set that to np arrays. Then here, I am just going to solve for the intercept. And in this case, we're going to take the average of the observed costs which is our y sample and subtract it by the beta value multiplied by the average of the observed of the hours spent mining in our sample data set. Okay, now let's run our function. What I'll call it is intercept. And I'll set that equal to lin reg beta or Apologies, lin reg intercept. 
and we need to give the x y sample and the beta as the inputs and let's return this great our intercept or in this case just to simplify things this is where we'll have the slope of the line cross for our model is right around here forty dollars and what this will do again is as we continue to increase the hours of mining we're going to add forty dollars to each of this and incrementally make it more and more expensive over time to mine a additional bitcoin next we're actually going to predict each of the values and what we'll do is this is the mathematical notation and what we're really doing is we're predicting the cost of bitcoin mining and we're going to take the intercept of the model add that add the coefficient estimate which is beta the beta function that we made multiplied by the number of hours spent mining and this is its explicitly written out for our model. So our model is going to take the number of hour, hours of mining, of time spent mining, it, we could just use one, we'll multiply one by 93.97, that's going to get our first cost, then we have the additional cost of the intercept and we add that to it. So it'll be a little over $130 for one hour of mining one Bitcoin. Okay, let's code this out now. Let's run this. And congratulations, you've coded out your first simple linear regression by hand. And what we've done here is we have predictions for each hour of mining. And what I could do here is I can also print this out And here we just have this explicitly written out for our model. For one hour of mining, the predicted cost is $134.33. For two hours of mining, the predicted cost is $228.30. And this goes down all the way to 11 hours, and the cost at that point will be $1,073.99. And we can see that this is incrementally increasing and there is some linearity but again we have that random value in there that's not that's making this process not perfectly linear and we can graph this out as well and what we have here these little circles here are the actual observations and these are the actual cost of the of mining a bitcoin and this purple line is the predicted cost and we can see that there's a bit of difference here but what this line does is it tries to best fit the prediction based on the given data and we can see here that the prediction is relatively close here and what we can actually do is we can compare the actual cost and i'll add this and now that we can see this, we have the predicted cost and the actual cost. They're close, but they're definitely not the same. And we can see that there's a difference between the two. What we'll eventually do is we'll have to take a look and this is how we're going to test how well our model does is the difference between the predicted cost and the actual cost, which is known as accuracy. And this is just another tabular way of looking at this. And this is a graphical way of looking at this. Great, let's move on. And let's actually take a look at the slope of the two. And for our model, the slope is constant like it was for our linear function. That's because our linear regression is somewhat like a linear function where it, the slope is going to be constant and we're just trying to make the line fit as well as possible given the data 
but you won't see the line move in weird ways to fit the the data making it nonlinear. Okay. There's another way of modeling the linear a linear simple linear regression and this is matrix form. And this is a very important concept and for some of you you may have not have had linear algebra yet, but this is a important concept to know and if you work in machine learning or want to learn machine learning and eventually break into the industry, you'll definitely need to have linear linear algebra in your toolbox. And again, this might be daunting, but I tried to break it down here and we'll go line by line to understand each of these and what it means. So what this is going to do is I'm going to take I'm going to predict the intercept and the, the coefficient for our linear regression. And we're going to do this by taking x and taking the dot product of x transpose x, and we're going to invert that and multiply that by x transpose the known, the y samples. And I have a, another previous video, an intro to linear algebra. I'll include that in the link in the description below if you want to check that out just to understand what a transpose is and what a dot product is if you've never worked with a with linear al algebra before. And this operation here is going to get us our coefficients. And then this operation down here is going to get us our array of predictive values. And this is going to take the transpose of x, multiply it by an array of the beta sub one, which is the coefficient and add the intercept to it. So it, it's very similar to the algebraic form of it. Okay. And I just had this listed out here in case every anyone wants a broken down version of this where we have the Y samples. This is what it looks like in matrix form. Then we have the X. You'll notice that we have the ones here and we need to put in the one values, a, a row of one values for in order to be able to do this for the intercept itself. And we have the X here. And we're going we have that X transpose, which is when we take the rows and columns and we flip them. So here we have two rows and 11 columns. Here we have two columns and 11 rows, and that's known as the transpose. We're going to next take the dot product. And what we're going to do is we're going to take X and take the dot product of x transpose x. And the way that we take the dot product is for this top row here, we'll take each of these ones and multiply it by this row. And we'll multiply one by one, one by one, and we'll continue to do that down the rows and down this column. And we can see here that all of these are ones and there are 11 ones in total. So if you multiply each of the ones together and you add all the ones together, the product of the ones together, you're going to get 11. And then you do the same thing for the next column is you take one and multiply it by one, two multiply it by one, and you continue down the line until you do that and you sum all over these. So it in reality, this bottom one is the sum of this row, and that will get you 66. And you'll do, we'll do the same thing for this next column where we multiply one by each, and that's going to get us the same value, 66. Then we'll take this and we'll conduct the same operation where we're going to take one, multiply by one, two by two, so on and so forth, all the way down. And this is going to get us our next matrix, which is X dot product X transpose. And we have this two by two matrix. 
And this is because we have two rows here by multiplied by two columns, and it compresses the matrix down to this. Then what we'll do is we're going to take the inverse of this matrix. And I have the operation shown on the screen here just to give you an idea of how the inverse of a matrix is taken. So we have this scalar and we rearrange the values here and we multiply each of the values by that scalar to get our inverted matrix. And it's very important to note that in order to invert a matrix, it needs to be square. Okay, and then finally we, or next, we need to get the dot product of Y and X transpose. And to get our intercept and our slope or beta coefficient, we have to put all of these together and we get the following. And we'll note that this is the same as the beta and intercept that we got when we did this algebraically. And for the final part of this is we'll take the, in order to predict the values and get a estimate of the matrix of a, a array of the estimates, we'll take the X transpose multiply that by the beta coefficient, which in this case will be 93, and we add the 40. And this is exactly like the, the algebraic way of doing this. Same thing, just a different method of doing it with linear algebra. And at this point, since I walked through this all, I'll just copy and paste the code and just make some comments on it. And the way that we can really do this is with NumPy and NumPy allows us to do this algebraically. We make sure that in case somebody puts a list into this that we convert it into an NP array. We have to add in the ones to our X array for our intercept calculation. We need to also reshape the matrix. Then next we do the transpose operation we do the x dot x transpose, and dot just stands for dot product. Take the inverse of that. Then we find the x and dot product of the y, and we'll, we're going to return the, the beta coefficients, which is the intercept and slope, and that gives us our fit. That's the first function. And then our next function is the actual prediction where we have to input the X values, which is the number of hours of that's an array. And we multiply that by and add it by the coefficients. And that gives us our, our prediction, our linear regression in matrix form. And we'll see that once we run this, looks like that was coded out correctly. And we have all our predictions listed out here. And I'll bring this up later, but we'll see that these correspond to the previous method algebra that we did algebraically for the estimated cost of mining a Bitcoin. And let's just put this up here. And we can see that like the previous one, we have the same exact line, which is our model here our model given the Y samples here, which are the blue dots. And our purple line is our predicted values for each of the hours mined. Let's make sure that we're coding out all of these linear regressions correctly. What I'm going to do is I am going to call sklearn and I'm just going to copy and paste these values here. And what we're going to use SK learns module to just double check that we modeled everything correctly and that our linear regressions are following the correct interpretation. And this is just the model that we use. We have to call fit like we did before, and then we have to predict, and we just have to do some reshaping here. And if you want to 
use any of sklearn's model it's one of the go-to's for machine learning and statistics within python so let's run this and let's compare the outputs of each and we can see that we were able to our models were correctly input and created and we have our first model here which is regression by algebra same values across linear regression by linear algebra which is the second model that we just created same across and then we have the scipy module just to compare to ours and make sure that it's a sanity check and making sure that we actually computed everything correctly the last thing I want to do is I want to compare the run times of each of these. And this actually gets some interesting results. So if we run each of these. And we can compare the time times run. So our first model was a little slower than the SciPy module, where it took 594 microseconds to run our first model. And for SciPy's model, it took 569 microseconds. But interestingly enough, our the second model we created was pretty fast relative to both the models. And it just shows the power of the linear algebra and how well NumPy is put together and really highlights why it's worth understanding and being able to in implement linear algebra and creating these by hand because you might be able to in a certain use case create a model that's faster than something out of a package and that could be very useful if you're working with a very large data set okay next we're going to look at something called the mean squared error and I mentioned this earlier before, we need to test out how well our model is actually predicting the each of these values. And we, get, we saw from above from our print function that it wasn't perfect, so there was some error. And I have a previous tutorial on just on mean squared error that I made if you want to go more in depth into the concept. But for this video, I'll just go through what we're actually computing. So we have the actual values. And in this case, y sub i are the y samples here. So we have the y sample here. And then we also have the predicted values that we were able to come up with ourselves. And this is the y pred. And we can see that it's a bit different. So I can actually sample minus y pred and this here is known as the error so our model was either over or under on each of these then what we do is we're going to square each of these and take the sum of those and that gets us what's called a mean squared error or how many how many mistakes the model made and what this does is if there are a lot of mistakes made and if the mistakes are large the model is going to be more penalized and this mean squared error is going to be very large what we want is a model with a small mean squared error and that just sh that shows that our model is accurately predicting the values but there might also be something that's called overfitting. We won't get into that, but something to keep in mind and research further if you're interested. And the way I really want to compare this is I want to take a, another model and I want to compare that model to this model. And what I'll do is I'll use something called K nearest neighbors regressor. And this is a non-linear model to predict the observed values for the and predict the the cost of mining a bitcoin given the data set and that's what this knn pred is going to be and it's a 
estimate of the cost for hour one, hour two, so on and so forth. We're going to compare that mean squared error of this one to our model. And I'm just going to copy and paste this from a previous tutorial I made. Again, if you want to check it out, check that video out. I'll link that in the description. Next, I'm actually going to implement this. So the way that we implement this is I call it MSC, which is the mean squared error, and it's going to calculate it. We'll first calculate it for our linear regression model, and we'll do Y sample, and it could be either Y pred or Y pred lin. They're all the same. And what this is, is if, if we take a look at this, th this is the mean squared error value. And it's a bit meaningless without having something to compare to, which is why I want to compare it to the K and N regressor. And same thing where we have the actual observed values and then the K and N predicted values. And I'll run this. And we can see that the error is much larger for the KNN. So the KNN model did a fairly did a pretty bad job in predicting the values relative to the linear regression, simple linear regression for this model. And we can see here that the mean squared error is 10,524 while the mean squared error is only 1,296, so almost a magnitude of 10 difference between the two. And we can also visualize this. So if I run this, and remember the purple line is going to be the linear regression model. So it predicts that it's a little over $100, and this blue dot here is the actual observed value. And we can see that the KNN was way off. There's uh, a 300, maybe $300, $250 difference between the two, between the predicted cost and the actual cost. Same thing here is the, it was way off relative to our linear regression model. And it got a little, little better here and we can see that the linear regression is clearly non-linear because or the k and n regression is non-linear because it's all bent all over the place but it really even in these places didn't do a better job in predicting the values relative to linear regression and it just shows how powerful linear regression can be even though it's a simple one with only one explanatory variable it can it can do a better job than other models. Okay, now we are going to test the assumptions that I listed before, and this is a very important part of this. Since we created our models, we were able to, and we were able to see how well they did. Now we need to see how well the model actually conforms to the assumptions that are made. And what I'll do is I'm going to actually create a larger data set in order to, and we're going to look at this mostly visually. And we can see here that we have our larger data set. So we're going from one hour up to, and not including 1000, so it'll be 999 hours. We're st we still want to use the NP random seed here. And we're going to run our function for that creates our artificial data set on these. And this creates our Y sample, which will model. The first assumption that we need to make is that there's a linear relationship between the dependent and independent variable. And the way that we do this is we can just do this visually. And this is not an awfully scientific way, but it's we can visually confirm that there seems to be a linear relationship. And we can see this graphed out here that as X is continually increasing, we have a increase on the Y axis, which is the cost for Bitcoin. And it is continually 
increasing in a line. And we have a little, little bit of noise here where it's not perfectly linear, but it approximates linearity. And we can see for our linear regression here, this is a completely linear. And if we go all the way back up to our initial linear function, it's that straight line. So our a linear regression does do pretty well in estimating this the data and it meets that first assumption. The next assumption that we have is the independence of errors. And the way that we do this is we need to calculate the errors and what we're going to do is we're going to first take and we're going to create a linear regression model for our second data set and this is and then we're going to save these predictions into ypred2 so we have our predictions for this data set and we can just take a look by slicing at the first 10 val at the first 10 values and we can see that it increments it also note that the values are a bit different relative to our previous model that we made. And that's because we have a different data set now. We have much more data and the beta coefficient and it, and as well as the intercept are a bit more different. You'll recall that the slope or the beta coefficient one was 93. If we take a look at the coefficients now, our intercept is much smaller at negative 0.4. So it was 40 before, but with much more data, our model estimates the intercept to be negative 0.4. And it also estimates the beta coefficient one to be 100. Next, we need to find the error for this data set. And the way that we do this is we take the observed y samples so that's going to be the estim the actual observed y costs and we have that saved in y sample 2 and we're going to subtract it by the predicted errors and we have our error here and we'll just save this into our variable called error 2 Next, what we need to do is we need to actually fit our error to our linear regression. And the way that we do this is we're going to take the predicted y values and the predicted error terms and fit it using linear regression. After that, we'll then predict the errors, the, the y prediction given the or apologies will predict the errors given the y prediction and this gets into independence so once i run this it it should be there should be no discernible pattern between the errors or the difference between the actual and observed values and the predicted values if there is then this is going to violate this assumption of independence of errors so let's run this Great, and this is what we want to see. If there were some sort of pattern here and we would have some sort of steep slope, either positive or negative, then we would have an issue and our second assumption would be violated and we really shouldn't use a linear regression or linear models for this. But since we don't have a discernible pattern here, the, error, the predicted values relative to the errors or this might also be called the residuals, does not have any, any real linear relationship that we can see. Next, we need to check that the errors are normal. And that means that when we graph these out and empir empirically look at the data, it should roughly look like a normal distribution. And we'll use the norm function from SciPy just to get the parameters for the errors. 
And then we'll also use the PDF here just to take a look at what the uh, normal distribution should look like for that. Let's take a look at this. Great, so it does roughly approximate a normal distribution. The blue, the blue columns here are the actual observed errors. And we can see that they're, they center around zero. So we have a lot of errors that are pretty low, which is a great thing. And as we go out further, we see less and less of those very large errors. And that means our, second, our third assumption has been met as well. Finally, we have our fourth assumption, which is homoscedasticity. And again, this might be a concept you might have to take some time to just understand some more. And really, it's the variance of the errors that need to be homoscedastic, which means that the variance is constant over time. So the way that we'll do this is we'll also we'll standardize these and I'll the way that we standardize these, so we're looking at them at the same scale, is we're going to take the the error, and for each of those errors, subtracted by the mean of the error and divided by standard deviation of the error. And we'll do the same thing for the y predictions. We'll standardize it by taking the difference between the two and dividing it by the standard deviation. And that will standardize it so we can compare the two. Let's run that. And let's graph this as well. And what we have here is it does follow, it is homoscedastic. And just to give everybody an idea, if we had a heteroscedastic value, it would look something like this, where it would be thin and then over time we would have this scattering which is would be a violation of the fourth assumption and that wraps up this video and this was a bit long but i think in order to really understand this this is the process what one of the best ways to go through it is this way just looking at the different methods of actually implementing linear regression where you can start off with the equation and code it out algebraically, or we can use linear algebra in order to do this, use that. And we also go over the assumptions and actually test the model to see how well it does using mean squared error. Thanks again for watching. If you want to learn more about linear regression, there's a lot to learn and a lot to understand. It's a very important topic and it's very, it's necessary if you want to do machine learning. Definitely if you want to do statistics, it's a core and really can't emphasize how important it is and how ubiquitous, how ubiquitous it is in academia as well as the real world. If you can check out all of these websites here in case you want to learn more, I use all of them. You can also check out anything by StatQuest. That's a great channel. Thanks everybody for watching. If you enjoyed the video, you can like it, you can subscribe. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, GitHub, or Twitter. Thanks again for watching everyone and happy coding.